Okay, let's start. Uh, the topic of this panel is managing external shocks. We have a fantastic panel with plenty of policy experience dealing with external shocks. In this panel, we have uh, Andres Velasco, the Dean of the School of Public Policy at LSE, and former Ministry of Finance of Chile. We have Karnit Flug, Professor of Hebrew University and former Governor of the Bank of Israel. We have Ricardo Hausman, uh, Director of the Harvard Growth Lab, uh, former uh, Minister of Planning of Venezuela, former Chief Economist at the IDB. And we have Jose Darío Uribe, Executive President of Fondo Latinoamericano de Reservas and former Governor of the Bank of the Republic of Colombia, the Central Bank of Colombia. Before we start, let me just say uh, that Guillermo has played a crucial role at the policy level in many emerging markets economies, highlighting this, the importance of macroeconomic policy credibility. It is precisely credibility gains uh, that many emerging markets have uh, generated by meeting their targets, what has allowed them to respond with flexibility when facing external shocks. Uh, and that has allowed them uh, to reduce welfare losses. And this is important for our societies. But Guillermo will always remind us that macro policy will be effective now and in the future only if credibility is preserved, a lesson that we cannot forget. Andres Velasco, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much, Luis. I have to say that uh, I've been to great conferences, but uh, this is very much at the top of my list. So Martin, Andy, and everybody who organized it, uh, thank you so much. I want to begin with uh, a fact which may be amazing or sad. Uh, let's say it's amazing. I came to this building to study economics with Guillermo Calvo 39 and a half years ago. Not quite 4-0, but almost. I did not plan to be a macroeconomist. In fact, I didn't really like macroeconomics. But then my first semester was with Calvo, and the second semester of PhD macro was with Mori right there. And um, make a long story short, I became a macroeconomist. And here I am 40 some, 39 and a half, almost 40 years later. I want to talk today about sort of an aspect of Guillermo's work that is connected to the theme of the panel, but also something that we haven't really discussed very much, which is um, the emerging market side of macro and monetary policy. When uh, I was here for four years at Columbia, I learned from Guillermo that there are three kinds of policymakers. They're just bad policymakers who do bad things. In Argentina, they tend to be Peronists. Um, <laughs> but that does not exhaust the uh, range of policymakers. <clears throat> then they are good policymakers who mean to do well, but who fail to understand that what they think today that they will want to do tomorrow is not what they will want to do tomorrow once tomorrow rolls around. And that, of course, is time inconsistency. So you can be a good guy, you can mean well, but do the wrong thing because of time inconsistency. That's a famous econometrica paper, 1978, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now there's a third kind of policymaker that we haven't talked about much today, and which is linked to another famous 17, sorry, 1978 paper, not on econometrica, but in JET, um, which Guillermo taught us with great relish, and it's a paper about indeterminacy of the price level and the rate of inflation if you use the interest rate as a target. And so you can have an, a policymaker who's a good guy, who means very well, who's not time inconsistent, but who picks the wrong instrument, therefore you end up with multiplicity, multiple equilibria, and potentially all kinds of bad things. So if you were a Calvo student, and a Maury student uh, in the 1980s at Columbia, you came away with um, sort of three things in your head. The first one was you saw time inconsistency and lack of credibility everywhere. 
And, you know, I became a politician later, and believe me, uh, that came in very handy. Um, I thought about, you know, how do I make myself credible uh, a lot of the time. Not, not sure I succeeded, but at least it was in the back of my mind. The second thing that uh, we haven't really talked about here, but which is very much part of the Calvo legacy, is that you also learn to see multiple equilibria everywhere. And I understand maybe policymakers from developed nations don't like to think about multiple equilibria, but if you come from Latin America, uh, and if you're a stu student of Guillermo's, you see multiplicity everywhere. And a lot of the things that happen out there which are not good may be perhaps attributable to, um, to uh, you know, non-uniqueness of equilibria, landing in the bad equilibrium, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, these two problems, and this is the third thing that I learned from Guillermo, these two problems become a lot more acute in nations with currencies that people may want to dump uh, one good morning or one good afternoon. Right? It is one thing to be conducting monetary policy in a country which has the dollar or the euro or, I was going to say the pound, but maybe the pound is no longer in that category. Uh, sorry, uh, Brits present. Um, you know, that's one business. It's a very different business um, to be um, running monetary policy and setting interest rates in a currency from which you cannot emerge in an emergency. Um, and Guillermo has been doing a lot of work on this, which we haven't talked about very much today. Uh, and of course, that's a work on the price uh, theory of money, on what makes people hold this money, because prices are sticky in that money, but not necessarily that other money, because there are no prices that are sticky in that money. And that holds for the Argentine peso and the Brazilian real and so many other currencies. So if this is your view of the world, if you see lack of credibility everywhere, if you see multiplicity everywhere, and you also worry that your currency is wobbly, how do you think about policy? So let me talk about policy because this is a policy panel. Well, one of the things that I like about Guillermo is that he was never keen on orthodoxy. So he never quite believed most of the things that we're all supposed to believe in. That is to say, over the last 25 years, we were all supposed to believe in flexible exchange rates. He never liked them. We were all su supposed to you know, like inflation targeting and using the interest rate as uh, the tool. He never quite believed in it. And you know, Guillermo's uh, policy proposal, if you want to put it this way, 40 years ago, and I suspect today, you may correct me, Guillermo, was fix the exchange rate, failing that, do a currency board, failing that, dollarize. Uh, and that gets rid of the credibility problem, that gets rid of the multiplicity problem, and that gets rid of the wobbly currency problem. So if you can do that, one tool, you solve three problems, you're done, off to have a drink. Now, Looking back over the last 35 years, and I promise I will get to the current situation in a minute, that particular set of policies, and I'm being a little unfair here, doesn't look too good in the sense that everybody in this room is aware that fixed exchange rates don't perform very well, certainly not in our part of the world, not if you speak Spanish. Um, we're also aware that currency boards you know, are not sustainable. Argentines in the room know that very well. And I would add something a little bit less obvious, that one of the attributes of fixing exchange rate or dollarizing, namely the idea that you would get fiscal discipline as a result, uh, I think lies in tatters. You know, the euro was adopted, and what happened to southern Europe? It became more fiscally irresponsible, not more fiscally irresponsible. And uh, if you're from Latin America, think of Ecuador, no, no currency, massive debt, terrible fiscal policy, uh, the same is true, of course, of El Salvador nowadays. They're also going into crypto, which is doubly crazy. Um, bottom line, that particular approach to solving the three Calvo problems uh, doesn't seem to have been too successful. In addition, in defense of current orthodoxy, I would argue that in Latin America over the last 25 years, inflation targeting and flexible rates did better than the esteemed Professor Calvo would have uh, given them credit. Um, Inflation did come down on a sustained basis. Uh, the currencies moved. There was a bit of fear of floating, but they moved more than we might have thought. And last but not least, it hasn't been impossible to build central banks with some credibility. Over the last 18 months, the central banks of Latin America, not Argentina, but Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile, 
have been surprisingly disciplined and surprisingly hawkish, which is not something we might have um, uh, expected. However, and this is what I want to say, and I want to say only one thing about the current situation, and then I promise I will stop. Maybe what we're seeing today is what I'm going to call the Calvo Revenge. Um, and the Calvo Revenge in my book, and this, I want to say this as a provocation because I don't have any econometrics to prove it, the Calvo Revenge is in, a, is in a situation in which you follow these policies of using the interest rate, of leaving yourself open to multiplicity, and you are stuck in the good equilibrium with low inflation for a while until you come unstuck. Um, and one possible interpretation of the sudden spike of inflation, not in the U.S., the U.S. is different, and of course, the fiscal policy in the U.S. has a lot of explanatory power, but the fact that in Latin America, and again, leave Argentina behind, you had a sustained and almost simultaneous increase in inflation in countries with very different monetary and fiscal policies. Take Mexico, hugely orthodox. Take Peru, big fiscal deficit, very similar uh, increase in inflation. Maybe one way of thinking about uh, the recent inflationary spike in Latin America is simply that Calvo was right, and that these policies do not tie down the price level, they do not tie down the exchange rate, they last for a while, they don't last forever, and therefore, when we, you know, now that COVID is behind us, we should revisit some of the problems of credibility some of the problems of um, multiplicity and some of the problems of wobbly currencies that Calvo has warned us about for a long time. I don't think the score is settled. My friend uh, Luis Cespes here is a central bank governor. He's probably thinking, I wish Velasco would stop, and I will do exactly that because I suspect he does not agree with me. Apologies, central bankers in the room, but I do think Calvo was right after all. Thank you. <laughs> so, first of all, I could actually start my, uh, my remarks just as you started, because I was uh, the student of uh, Calvo 40 years ago. Um, I didn't go and become a macroeconomist. Oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't immediately become a macroeconomist. I became a macroeconomist a bit later. But um, I actually had the uh, pleasure of serving together with uh, Guillermo and together also with uh, Enrique there on a committee that looked at the uh, framework, monetary framework at the Bank of Chile. And that was really a pleasure to get your insight and try to get uh, the theoretical insights into thinking about monetary policy framework. And that was really, uh, I was lucky for that, and I'm really uh, honored to be here and uh, talk about policy. So thank you, Guillermo. Um, so how does a policymaker respond to the kind of shocks that are listed here in the name of this uh, panel? And the shocks actually reveal themselves uh, gradually, and you uh, need to rely on very partial information uh, in order to actually identify the shocks, the nature of the shocks, the severity of the shocks. And I think very generally I would say that I've heard a lot of uh, theoretical papers here, and as a policy maker I always think how do I identify in the data where we are in terms of, for example, in terms of the, uh, the various models that were discussed here. So I think that uh, these are the shocks that most uh, emerging economists and also Israel experienced recently, but I think there is at least one important additional element that, was very, that played a very important role in the recent period, and this is uh, the uh, fiscal policy and the aftershock of the pandemic at the, and at least uh, in the case of Israel, there was a huge surge of demand. Growth has been very strong, and it's partly a result of very, very expansionary policy with very slow withdrawal of expansionary policy, and also pent up demand that resulted from the fact that actually incomes didn't go 
uh, down during the pandemic because of the expansionary policy, but people couldn't spend, and now they, uh, they were faced with large, actually forced saving, and then they went on a shopping spree. So that added actually to the pressures. So I think the challenge for a policymaker is really to distinguish between the supply shocks and the demand shocks, and uh, to what extent some of them are transitory uh, or, uh, or persistent. And we actually have to look for clues in the data in order to sort of disentangle these shocks. And uh, uh, one of the things we were looking at the data is, for example, how concentrated are price uh, increases? Are they mostly of goods and resulting from problems in the supply chain? or in, uh, from the war in, uh, in the Ukraine and Russia, or are they spreading to non-tradables? So for example, well, first of all, uh, inflation started moving up everywhere at around the same time. Israel here is in blue, and you see that uh, it has uh, seen a steadily rising inflation. Now it's at 5.4, so it's more modest than in most uh, economies. But when we look at the uh, composition, oops, uh, when we look at the composition of the uh, price rises, what you can see that initially, really, the prices of goods started going up. That's uh, tradable goods. Um, as a result of the uh, supply shocks. But fairly soon after, and that's more or less in mid-2021, you see also rapid rise of non-tradable goods, which were much less affected by the uh, external uh, supply shocks. And actually, if we look now at the end of the period, uh, both are uh, standing at 5.4% or 55 so the spread of inflation is really encompassing uh, the whole economy. So I think it, it gives us a clue that it's not only uh, supply, uh, supply shocks. Um, okay, uh, then uh, obviously the, uh, one of the shocks that was, uh, that was mentioned in the title of the, uh, of the uh, session is the uh, fact that overall monetary policy has become tight, uh, financial uh, conditions become tighter. And in the case of Israel, after a very long period of time of appreciating a currency which helped sustain very low economy, a uh, very low inflation, we can see that in the beginning of 2022, actually uh, the currency started depreciating. I should say that due to a uh, domestic made shocks we have seen in the last months, a uh, very rapid uh, uh, depreciation, but that's less related uh, to the current, uh, to the current uh, discussion. Um, when we look at uh, inflationary expectations, we see actually a surge in the inf an increase in the inflationary uh, inflationary expectations again in the very early of 2022. And uh, one year inflation expectations uh, breached actually the inflation target, which is the range of 1 to 3 percent around the beginning of 2022. Uh, longer term expectations were relatively well anchored. You can see here the two to three year. Uh, expectations that actually uh, breached the upper uh, the upper part of the target uh, in early 2022, but longer term expectations for longer horizons uh, remained uh, well anchored, uh, assuming that uh, policy will respond according to how it should respond, so as to bring inflation uh, back to the target. Uh, the economy was uh, actually recovered in a remarkable way from the, uh, uh, from the slowdown of the pandemic. I should mention, and I don't have the slides here, uh, the recovery, actually our uh, recession was very mild, and the recovery was with a growth rate of 8.5% 8, 8 in 2021. 
6.5% in uh, 2022. So very strong recovery, which also shows since the beginning of 2022 with a very rapid increase in uh, wages. I should say, say that the noise uh, in wages before that is related to the composition of uh, employment during the pandemic where mostly people with high uh, wages remained employed and people uh, with, uh, in the services uh, were unemployed. So ignore these noises, but if you look at the trend, you see that wages are now, real wages in the private sector are uh, above the trend uh, that uh, uh, took place before the pandemic, and so is output. Output exceeds the level uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the trend output of before the pandemic. So we are very, I would say, close to a, a, a very, a, a, maybe even a negative output gap. Um, Interest rate responded. Uh, interest rate actually, the last reading is three. Po uh, sorry, is 4.25, and the first increase in uh, interest rate uh, took place in April of 2022. And the question is, and I think we uh, we heard it over uh, this uh, um, two days, whether the response was too low, uh, too late as actually everywhere else, because I think the, uh, interpret, the initial interpretation was that the, sh that the, res the inflation is the result of a mostly supply shocks, and therefore it's probably transitory. And I think the identification of the role that the very expansionary fiscal policy and the, uh, uh, and the uh, increase in demand as a result of the removal of restrictions, I think that the, the uh, realization what important uh, role that part play uh, actually came, came about only uh, later. So I think when I think what are the challenges uh, more uh, generally that I, did, that I uh, think about looking at this episode is that uh, I think the identification of, uh, of how, what play roles the demand factors and the supply factors, how to dis disentangle it, how you can uh, detect the different shocks from the data is, a very, is an important uh, challenge. The other challenge is that uh, uh, generally, I think central bankers tend to wait and see, uh, for example, uh, in the last episode, that inflation is actually exceeding the target before they move. However, we know that, uh, that monetary policy reacts with a substantial lag. And that means that when you react, you have to react much faster and in a, a greater strength than you would probably if you would not be behind the curve. Uh, whether or what is the cost of being behind the curve, I think we, it still remains to be seen. So I'll stop here. Well, um, it really, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure for me to be here uh, to honor Guillermo. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our joint history. Uh, and I want to thank the organizers, Andy and Martin, for really a, a, superb, a superb program, but also with the possibility to meet so many old friends that I hadn't seen, certainly since the pandemic. And uh, so it's, it's really emotional. I'm, I'm a very close friend of everybody in the panel, uh, which doesn't happen often to me these days. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very, very... Um, uh, happy to be here honoring Guillermo because uh, Guillermo was never my professor, but I think of him as my mentor. I met Guillermo in a sequence of seminars in the 1980s, in the days of a plan, plan Austral, Plano Cruzado, Plano Verão, <laughs> uh, the, the, the or, or, uh, heterodox stabilization in Israel, um, and he was, at the time, I think, at the IMF with Jacob. Um, 
1993, I spent a summer at the IMF when I left government. Um, and then uh, I was uh, chosen to be uh, the, the chief economist of the Inter-American, the, the first chief economist to the Inter-American Development Bank, where I had to imagine and create what the, a research department should look like in, in an institution like that one. And uh, in those days, I, I would talk a lot with Guillermo, and he not only gave me advice on, on, on you know, policy discussions on issues, but he also gave me advice on who to hire. And uh, I ended up hiring a very distinguished uh, group of economists, in part by uh, suggestions of, of Guillermo. And I must say that one of my proudest achievements as chief economist of the Inter-American Development Bank was uh, to convince Guillermo to succeed me. And, uh, and I think uh, it would not have been a cool enough place had it not been for his mentoring. So. Um, now, everybody has uh, talked about many aspects about Guillermo, but I don't see anybody having mentioned opera. But, uh, uh, you know, among the things that uh, I remember discussing with Guillermo was he has very sophisticated views about opera. So um, I learned a lot about that from him. Um, this uh, is a seminar on government credibility. And I think that the uh, government credibility is extremely important, but not only for fiscal and monetary policy, but for other policies. And I think that uh, the ideas of Guillermo and uh, people who have contributed to this literature are extremely important and relevant for other policy issues that the world is discussing right now. Uh, and I'm going to talk about why they are so relevant in the context of the energy transition, green growth, and decarbonization. So first of all, um, uh, one of the things uh, in which the world will change when oil will no longer be sort of like a dominant form of energy <coughs> is that the world will no, will no longer be energetically flat. Oil is exquisitely dense from an energetic point of view, which makes it amazingly cheap to transport, which means that the price of oil follows the law of one price. If it costs $80 in Saudi Arabia, it will cost $82 in Japan. You know, it, 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 it's flat. Now that has one very important consequence, that in, in the world that we know today, energy poor countries have been able to develop comparative advantage in energy intensive products. If you look at where energy intensive activities happen, a lot of them happen in energy poor countries, no problem, they just bring in the energy. Renewable energy, is much, much harder to transport. Dramatically harder to transport. Ridiculously harder to transport. Uh, today, with today's technology, you can generate in a good part of the world a megawatt hour of energy through solar energy at $20. In today's technology, uh, if you take that same energy make hydrogen, green hydrogen with it, and then you transform that green hydrogen into green ammonia, it'll put you back $400 a megawatt hour. Maybe 300 if you're lucky, okay? So it means that if you have the choice of choosing, using the energy where it hits, or using the energy where you wish it hit, the price difference is somewhat significant. Now, that is because uh, uh, that is something that's already impacting the world, not directly because of oil, but because of natural gas. And we can see a little bit about the future of the world, in, of a green world, in the present of, of, of uh, uh, the situation with a natural gas market. I just checked this morning, and the price of uh, 
Henry Hub natural gas, okay? Uh, Henry Hub is $2.3 a million BTUs. Europe is now relaxing because finally they got over this natural gas price crisis where it went to $200. So now it's low and it's just 49.3 euros per million BTUs, meaning it is 23 times higher than the price in the US. Under those conditions, it's really, really difficult for energy intensive industries in Germany that produce chemicals, that produce uh, um, uh, steel, etc., uh, to be competitive. That means that in the world that I am envisioning, energy intensive activities will have to move closer to places that are rich in renewable energy. It's not that you just move the energy to where you want to use it, it's that you, you, you need to use those activities that are producing tradable goods that are movable, it will be cheaper to move the goods than to move the energy because of the change in the, in the cost of energy that we're going forward. But interestingly enough, you might say this is a, 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 um, an event on uh, credibility, not on environment. What the hell does credibility have to do with all of this? Well, it just so happens that the cost structure of the new energies make the cost of capital a fundamental determinant. Because the sun, the rain, and the wind are free. There are no input costs in that industry. All the cost is the cost of installing the capacity and paying the financial cost. The world, the first best for the world is to install that capacity where that capacity generates the biggest bang in terms of energy produced. And then because it's hard to move, to use as much as possible of that energy in place. That would be sort of like the first best. That would save us gazillion solar panels, gazillion windmills, gazillion electrolyzers, or gazillion stuff, no? if we were able to allocate things that way. In, in, what's a good place? Well, a good place, for example, where it's sunny, in, say the Atacama Desert in Chile or something, you get capacity. In, in, these are called um, capacity something. Capacity ratios of 30 3%, say, because you know, the sun shines at the maximum at noon. You know, it sun shines like 12 hours a day, but not at maximum rate. So say, say 35% or something capacity. Okay? In Germany, it shines at 9% capacity. But a solar, a kilowatt hour of solar energy in Germany is cheaper than a kilowatt hour of solar energy in the Dominican Republic because the advantage of 9% versus 35% doesn't compensate the difference in interest rates. So interest rates become a fundamental determinant of, if you want, comparative advantage. Now, what is behind these interest rates? Well. Credibility, right? Credibility that your debt is good, that you will do good on your debt, etc. And credibility is not only a question of you know sovereign debt. There is credibility specific to these investments, because these investments are very bulky. They happen at the beginning, so you put all cash flow looks like the cash flow of an investment in a bond, right? You buy the bond up front. And why do you buy the bond up front? Because you're expecting a future cash flow that you're going to collect. But once you've done the investment, time and consistency means that now you may want to default on those future payments, that people might benefit from cheaper electricity, that, uh, et cetera. So you might expropriate the cash flow either through nationalizations or just through uh, uh, price regulations and so on. In anticipation of that, 
interest rates are high to compensate for country risk, sovereign risk, if you want, and the risk that you will have in the regulation of those industries. So in some sense, regulating electricity has the same flavor as monetary policy. Now with monetary policy, it has become super acceptable, the idea that central banks should be independent and everybody has gone to independent central banks. There has also been a movement to push for the independence of regulators. And what's the benefit of giving independence to your regulator? That the market is going to perceive that you are less risky, it, the average cost of capital will be lower, and you will get cheaper energy or cheaper electricity or, and, and cheaper, cheaper uh, um, and, and more investment and so on. So, so you, you tie your hands by empowering an independent entity in order to get the benefits that uh, that, that is solving the time inconsistency problem would generate. However, there isn't the same level of political awareness or political focus on this issue as there is for monetary policy. So for example, uh, 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 Jose Antonio Campo is in the audience still. Allí está. For example, uh, Jose Antonio, I hope uh, you will prevent your president from taking away the independence of the energy regulator, uh, or that you know, he should stop playing away with sort of like the, 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 um, the contracts that were signed for to get uh, infrastructure, to roads going. I mean, roads has the same problem. You put the roads at the beginning, you need the positive cash flows in the future, but you have an incentive to default. And there's been a, uh, a partial default on, on those contracts that uh, are not actually a default because uh, Jose Antonio is going to make these contracts whole. Uh, but, uh, but it comes at a huge fiscal cost and so on. So, but the same story has happened in Mexico. I haven't seen it. I mean, the, uh, AMLO has destroyed the possibility of having private investment in electricity playing with these same things. And uh, I think that in, in Guillermo's ideas and the ideas of people in the room that have helped us understand time and consistency uh, are super important uh, to make sure that this energy transition that we're going to see happens in the most efficient way possible. Uh, I, I like to say that uh, governments uh, are very focused right now on having each one of them uh, reduce the, go the emissions of coal, of carbon from their countries. And, and everybody you know, asks, well, what are you going to do to reduce your emissions? And what are you going to do to re do reduce your emissions? I think that may be the wrong frame for the challenge that societies are facing. The world needs to reduce its emissions. The idea that for the world to reduce its emissions, everybody needs to reduce its emissions is a fallacy of composition. So the question should not be, what are you going to do to reduce your emissions? The question should be, what are you going to do to help the world reduce its emissions, global emissions? What are you going to do to help others reduce their emissions? And one way you can help others reduce your emi their emissions is by you exploiting your uh, renewable resources efficiently and doing, your, and doing in your country the things the world will lose to reduce their efficiency. You will do uh, the, the lithium for batteries or the batteries or the uh, solar panels or whatever. You're going to make things that the world will need to reduce their emissions. But for you to do that, you need to keep the cost of capital low. And to keep the cost of capital low, you have to listen to Guillermo Calvo. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to participate in this conference in honor of uh, Guillermo Calvo. As a Colombian, I am very grateful to Guillermo. He was uh, in the early 70s, I think, he was a professor in, at the University of Los Andes and advised many policy makers on many occasions. Uh, as an economist, I have been influenced by his academic work and, and his seminar presentations and discussions. 
And uh, Guillermo is a terrific uh, marvelous human being who leaves his mark on all of us who are fortunate enough to know him. Andrew Neumeyer asked me to talk about handling shocks that the country has been facing following the pandemic. Uh, for that purpose, I will briefly go over the main macro trends in the global economy and then focus in Latin America, identifying some of its strengths and risks. Lastly, I will conclude with some policy considerations. Let's begin very quickly with some macro trends. We know that the world economy is slowing down in many, in many countries in the world is already slowing down. Among other things, for global financial conditions have been tightened, asset prices have fallen in some places, and falling asset prices, rising, bar bar raising borrowing costs and high energy prices, among others, have weakened consumer and investor confidence. Uh, Second, inflation has widely exceeded inflation targets. The strong increases in demand due to fiscal and monetary stimulus and pet up spending during the pandemic clashed against supply chains, bottlenecks, and high energy prices, particularly associated with the Rus Russian invasion to Ukraine. This applies to some countries, but some other countries is more, more a, a supply side phenomenon, but so there is different, for, uh, we know, between uh, Europe and the US, but, but in general, this is the point that I want to stress. And inflation peaked and has subsided in some countries in the extent that commodity prices have fallen and central bank have raised policy interest rate. However, however, inflation is expected to be above its target in 2023. And, uh, and the third consideration is that the U.S. dollar has sharply appreciated since, I think, May or something since, since middle of 2021, with short-lived setbacks and with moments in moving in the other direction, but in general, it has appreciated sharply. In real terms, uh, it is at a level similar to those seen in the middle of 1980s. This appreciation of the U.S. dollar has been particularly strong against currencies of other advanced economies, but it has also been observed in emerging economies, also, also with divergent behavior between countries. In several instances in the past, Latin America has been severely affected when the U.S. interest rate rise, the Fed interest rate rise, the dollar is strong and the world economy is weak. Overall, in the current global environment, Latin American countries uh, have shown some strain, or I don't know exactly resilient, but let's say some type of strain so far. This is remarkable due to the magnitude and diversity of the negative shocks the region has faced, including strong poli political tensions and sharp increases in public spending and public debt during the years of the pandemic. At least four factors explain, in my opinion, the, the strain or the, or the capacity to respond to Latin American economies. And they contrast with other past episodes. First, I think that the flexible inflation target in the skin, uh, the strength in the, of financial supervision and regulations, and improved fiscal institutions have strengthened macro financial framework in some countries. And I think that we continue to work uh, well. I am positive about uh, that. that the, the, this type of uh, changes that we had uh, since the early 90s uh, pay off and will continue to pay off. Second, pre-pandemic foreign capital flows were lower than those seen in the past episodes. And they were not accompanied by unsustainable growth in domestic long, long and answered prices. I'm referring to Latin America. Third, the Fed seems to be more sensitive to the public possible effects of monetary policy actions on other economies, particularly emerging economies. This is reflected in the language used when communicating policy actions. And fourth, monetary and financial authorities have improved the, their policy instruments to limit financial vulnerabilities and create buffer against external shock including those provided by the Global Financial Safety Net, the IMF, Regional Financial Arrangement, as FLAR, and swaps among central banks. 
However, we cannot take for granted that the resilience or the, the strength of the Latin American economies will endure. Countries in the region are high, highly dependent on external fi financing. This makes them vulnerable to, charge, to changes in global investor resentments, sometimes leading to sudden stop or outflux. Guillermo is uh, the mandatory reference on this subject. Public debt has significantly increased in recent years, and government expenditure pressure seems to be escalating. Moreover, foreign investor shares in total public debt have reached levels between 20 and 50 percent in some countries. This makes Latin America vulnerable to local currency depreciation and to changes in the risk sentiment of foreign and local investors. This is also applicable to the fiscal deficit inherited from the pandemic and from food and gasoline subsidies, subsidies aimed at tempting high inflation. These subsidies and transfers may be difficult to eliminate, and in some countries there seems to be an interest, interest in reinforcing or supplementing them with others. In those circumstances, sovereign risk may, may abruptly increase with the consequences noted above. With high public debt level and spending pressures, foreign capital flows may be particularly sensitive to the differences preferentials between domestic interest rates and interest rates in the United States, mainly to the United States, as well as to GDP growth, growth forecast. Although inflation is easing in some countries, there is a risk that in order to achieve price stability, additional increases in interest rate will be required, or policy interest rate will have to remain high for longer than currently expected. This risk is especially challenging for the, region eco the region's economies. If it actually materializes in the United States, interest rate differen differentials and lower expected GDP growth could lead to sharp moves in capital flows to the evaluation of local currency and to lower economic growth and employment. And we all know that Guillermo has to study this phenomenon, this type of phenomenon in depth for, for years. On the other hand, there is a risk that the combination of high debt levels and high interest rates will lead to, a, to larger than necessary adjustment in the economy. This means that the tightening of monetary policy will be, have to be, le, to be less. How much less? Difficult to calibrate, very difficult. Even more if one takes into account that monetary policy in many countries with high levels of public or private debt has tightened simultaneously and many and may amplify his effects on growth. Simultaneously in many countries advance and, and, and emerging and, and so on. Lastly, some policy considerations. Fiscal policy is crucial. As Gita Gopinath recently pointed out, fiscal policy must achieve at least three things. I will say that uh, she said three things. I say at, at least three, th three things. First, it should be consistent with the goal of achieving price stability, meaning that, uh, comillas, I don't know, uh, quote, at the very least, it must not be expansionary. Second, fiscal policy must, must protect the most vulnerable. And finally, the commitment to, to commitment to maintain a called sound fiscal frameworks and clarity on bringing down debt is essential. I believe all the three recommendations properly apply to Latin American countries. As for monetary policy, interest rate hikes have been necessary to control inflation, avoid disorderly behaviors in the chain markets, and moderate foreign capital flows, outflows. However, this increases the risk of recession financial market tensions. In order to reduce those risks, it is essential for government to support fiscal and supply side policies, and central banks should identify and implement a chain rate or macroprudential measures that do not directly compromise interest rates. All these measures are different to, to the, the interest rate or, or, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the answer of, of fiscal policy have been to be co coherent in order to, to act. Otherwise, you generate even a a worse problem in the future. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that beyond Andres' uh, suggestion, 
that monetary policy frameworks in some emerging market economies have failed, uh, which is not supported by any empirical evidence. Uh, I think that what's happened is that the lessons that many emerging market economies have learned uh, through the years is that precisely credibility is extremely, extremely important. Uh, that if you want to face a shock like COVID, uh, uh, some people propose to have very aggressive monetary policy to face uh, the COVID. That w possibility was only due to the fact that monetary policy was credible. Without credibility, that injection of liquidity into our market would, wouldn't have been possible. Um, and because, precisely because in emerging market economies, we know how important credibility is in order to have flexibility, as Jose Dario was mentioning before, is uh, that we have to do anything uh, in order to restore price stability, because that price stability is precisely what is going to allow us to respond to shocks in the future. The panel was about responding on external shocks and to reduce output losses. So I think that, uh, in my opinion, what's happened is that precisely that uh, flexibility that emerging markets have in the past in order to respond to this external shock, that it was new, it was something new in many economies, uh, is something that we need to preserve. Uh, and I think that is, is, is a lesson that we learn and in which Guillermo has played a significant role in terms of uh, uh, providing that advice for many uh, policy makers. Uh, so let's open the floor for questions. Let me uh, be silent uh, all the time <laughs> because I don't think this is what I have to do, what I'm doing pre presently. And, uh, but this panel is uh, too close to my heart not to <laughs> react a little bit. Uh, I mean, Andres is right in saying that I've been uh, not very optimistic about the capacity to uh, have a flexible exchange rates and so on. Uh, but uh, looking at the recent experience, especially before the pandemic, you get the impression that uh, uh, countries in Latin America, at least, have been able to function and quite well. And some of them, like Colombia, doing something that it was unthinkable, uh, do a real exchange rate depreciation. Uh, don't forget the numbers, but very huge numbers without causing uh, inflation. On the contrary, just helping the adjustment. So this is a point that there are many, many, many aspects around this. Uh, and of course, uh, people get impressed by that. And they look uh, near the monetary uh, uh, centers in in Latin America, and they realize that uh, flexible exchange rates has been kind of the rule, except for some exceptions. And of course, the temptation is to say, you know, that's what it did. It did it. You have flexible exchange rates, and you were credible, and, and therefore, and you could have low inflation. Now, if you draw a diagram with inflation in Latin America, vis-a-vis -vis inflation in the US, you will be surprised by the high correlation. And, uh, and especially after the 2008, uh, the inflation has gone down, both, of course, in the US, but in emerging markets. So from, from that, and a more specific uh, uh, description of what happened, one gets the impression that uh, maybe a big factor for the success of flexible exchange rates is having a world where inflation was going down. Now you wonder why? Why should there be a correlation with the US? Well, you know, if we were uh, dollarized, that's exactly what's gonna happen. 
But you need to be, you don't need to be dollarized. If the market thinks that you're going to follow the dollar, uh, maybe not now for a while, but eventually if there is any adjustment which is necessary, uh, then, then it makes a lot of sense for there being a correlation between those interest rates. And if the market is simple-minded and they say, oh, that, you know, not to say, I don't want to insult anybody. Um, if the market uh, takes seriously the correlation between I inflation and flexible exchange rates and think that the cost is uh, flexible rates uh, when it would be the opposite, then we, we may be realizing that uh, some of the uh, re resilient an ability to control inflation that we've seen until recently uh, have a lot to do with the fact that the U.S. is happening, and then the U.S. and excess liquidity, and that has been not only they were swamped by li liquidity, as we all know, but, uh, but the Fed was uh, very active in preventing the crisis, the pandemic, to be transmitted to emerging markets. As you remember, when the pandemic was uh, found, at the beginning there was a big uh, depreciation in emerging markets, uh, but that led to a very proactive policy, monetary policy on the part of the US that reverted that immediately. It's impressive when you look at that. So the US is a big daddy for Latin America that has been around even though in, in 19, when Volcker, uh, in Volcker times, uh, the US looked the other side and concentrated in its own uh, inflation contraction uh, policy, right? So it was a, a radical change uh, of uh, policy that favored the expectation that emerging markets were going to be covered. Now, what we are seeing now is that the U.S. is in trouble. Uh, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen because nobody understands. I mean, uh, this is a new phenomenon. And what we've seen, and it's very interesting in Latin America, is many countries that have jacked up their interest rate before the U.S. and by much more. So what, what does it mean? Probably the fear that uh, that protection will go away and that sudden stops will start again because that's the way they started. That's why we started to, to think about that the episodes where all of a sudden emerging markets stop having the protection of a, a wealth central bank, could be the IMF, but the, the, the Fed, right, in, in, in Volcker times. So, sorry to be so long, but uh, I wonder to what extent you share the view that uh, we are going now through a period where there is concern that the, the, the uh, you sp talked about flexibility of uh, emerging markets which is gained by credibility. But credibility in an open world depends on, fo on external factors. By the way, that's another topic that I'm being obsessed about, external factors. So external factors have changed or people feel that will change. Will Latin America in particular be able to hold on to a stable economy even though they did went through this effort and going through this effort? And, and if you feel that the, uh, the capacity to do that will be more limited uh, given the conditions presently, what should one advise Central Bank? Is this a time to be even tighter? I mean, they seem to have been listening to somebody who said, move fast. And in the informal conversations with Central Bankers, I get that message. Move fast. 
why should they move that much more, right? And where should that uh, go up to? I don't know. That's a question. I don't have answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Questions? Uh, just to add to uh, Ricardo's example of uh, uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen, uh, Chile has uh, not only the Atacama Desert with its sun, as you mentioned, the best in the world, the best radiation, but also aeolic uh, energy in the south. And there are several companies that are already investing I mean, to produce uh, eventually uh, green hydrogen. And there is a pipeline of companies that want to come in. And uh, this is going to be a very big, but very big investment. And now, I think they must have solved the problem of the higher interest rates by this time. Probably they, since they're foreign, they just borrow in international markets. Or the... Uh, the risk premium, the spread of, uh, of for a Chilean borrower is the lowest in Latin America as well. So I don't know how they, they've, uh, they've tackled that particular problem. But I mean, I do know that this is, uh, already there are investments worth uh, $10 billion and it's supposed to go up to $50 billion easily in short order. More questions? Oh, everybody wants to go to the end. Henry. Picking up on what Guillermo was saying about uh, what countries do in, in Latin America, the American markets in particular, and what happens outside. So, two Calvo papers about this. One is uh, Calvo Lederman Reinhardt. So there we are all thinking that uh, these countries were came back to markets because they were doing so good things and they come these guys and say no, <laughs> it's because the United States and the advanced economies returns went down and capital just flooded uh, this region. And the other one is closer to Andres and the work we did on Chile and the Chile disinflation and the issue about whether there was a role for what was going on with copper prices and with the management of the real exchange rate and uh, the extent to which that kind of outside factors were contributing to the ability of the countries to do well in, in managing inflation. So I think in good, is that we're talking about it in the morning, to keep up the commandments when you're uh, in good times, it's easy. When things uh, get tricky, then you're tested and uh, how much, how easy it is to keep our credibility in, in, in trying times is, is very hard because the things you have to do in order to preserve it are much tough. And that's, I think, where we are. Yes, please. Yes. I'm, I'm very glad, first of all, that I induced uh, Guillermo to speak up. Thank you for that. Um, um, no, look, I think that if, you know, any one of us were dropped in some country and asked to conduct monetary policy, our natural instinct would be to say, sure, slow the exchange rate, target the interest rate, and, you know, uh, that's what uh, other things equal seems to work most of the time. But I think there are two issues that we're going to be, you know, the kind of serious economists that Guillermo has taught us to be. First of all, um, you know, in microeconomics as an industry of people who worry about causality. We macroeconomists are a little bit less rigorous about causality because, you know, we cannot get the Gates Foundation to pay for an experiment. Uh, but Ian was making a very important point, you know, we cannot be sure whether some of this was good luck or good policy, and we cannot disentangle those effects. We would like to think it was good policy, but we can't be sure. And the other thing that I'd say is that, um, of course, credibility is, is, is very important. You know, all the white hairs I have in my head, and there are plenty of them, I uh, developed when trying to, you know, build a credible fiscal policy in my country. So, yes, it is very important. But I think it is still an open question, uh, what Guillermo mentioned at the end. Uh, why is it uh, that to contain the depreciations of the exchange rate and to bring inflation down, 
Latin American countries, the serious ones, you know, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Mexico, had to hike so early, so high, uh, and for so long. Uh, yes, you know, we, in the absence of credibility, it would have been worse. But is that necessarily the first best policy, or is there some other way of bringing inflation down without that big sacrifice ratio? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think at least we should be thinking about it. Sure. Uh, let me um, uh, answer to Manuel. I think, I think Chile is a, is a good example to illustrate several things. Uh, first of all, um, uh, Chile shows how difficult it is to transport renewable energy. You have solar energy in the north, you have hydro in the south, but you, cannot, you don't have a connected electricity system because transmission is super expensive and complicated. Well, now, now we do. We, do. Yeah? we didn't use to, now we do. No, I'm not so sure. That, I'm not so sure. That th there's, there are capacity problems, uh, and, and the price of solar energy in the north oftentimes goes negative. And so, so I mean, it's just to say these things are complicated, okay? So um, second, second point I think that uh, Chile illustrates is that, you know, it has a very good framework for private investment in energy, right? And in mining. Uh, in energy, the government hasn't messed it up. The government hasn't messed it up, you might say, yet, but... It's very important that the Chilean society recognizes the benefits of the policies that were created to contain time inconsistency. Okay? That is expressed in the fact that Chile has smaller lithium reserves than Bolivia, that lithium last year paid more taxes to the Chilean government than copper, than Codelco did, mm. Right? And that not one ton of lithium has come out of Bolivia. Not one ton. Now, that means that you know, when the world talks to Bolivia, right now in COP, they want to ask, what are you going to do to reduce your emissions? Right? The world should be asking, what are you going to do to get that lithium out? Because without that lithium, we don't have car batteries, and we, don't have, uh, we can't electrify transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, I am a little bit less sure that this investment boom that you talk about will materialize because I have not seen too many projects get to financial closure mm -hmm. because nobody's signing off-take agreements. So everybody can generate the this green hydrogen. By the way, everybody's going to do green ammonia because green hydrogen is impossibly expensive to transport. But um, uh, uh, I haven't seen the offtake agreements. So, and that's why the wor that's what we, the world will need to know. So I'm hoping that the world will move in that direction. And I'm hoping that Latin America will be sufficiently smart not to uh, miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity again. Right, um, but, uh, uh, but it will depend in part on its ability to contain time and consistency. Just to, to, to give some ideas to Andres about what can happen, why some countries have to increase the interest rate so fast. Uh, let me give you young, young, just one information. When you have a transfer of 30% of GDP to household, I mean, you clearly are going to have a demand problem. Uh, so I think that the answer to the question of why, in the case of the Central Bank of Chile, we have to increase the interest rate so far and that much, I think that that 30% of GDP in fiscal transfer by the end of 2021 is a good starting point. Thank you very much to all the participants.